Hello! Welcome to Geologic Faults and Folds. I want you to take a look at this shot on I-35. This is right near Ardmore, Oklahoma, and you can kind of see where the rock layers have been bent and folded from their original position. So that happens after the rocks have been deposited. That's the law of original horizontality. But the key concept is this kind of deformation does not occur at the surface. It occurs beneath the surface, and we'll explain why as we go through our work today. Let's start with the three influencing factors that can lead to rock deformation. First is that you get rocks that can become more ductile as temperatures get hotter. So I have a candle here and it's not lit, but it's going to be really hard to manipulate anything about that candle and the wax in here. But as I heat that up, as you've probably experienced with candles or something similar to it, it becomes softer. Well, that's exactly what happens to rocks. Not at the surface, though. It happens as rock layers are buried lower and lower and deeper in the subsurface because of new rock layers being put on top. So the deeper it gets, the more pressure, and I might add heat, is applied to rocks. Sounding like that is a lot like metamorphism. <laughs> and it is. So let's get kind of to that por portion of the discussion today. There's something called geothermal gradient, and I'll define that here shortly. But that applies both in temperature and in pressure. So higher temperature for factor one, higher factor number two would be that pressure element. The higher the pressure, the more easily it is to make something malleable. So that means bendable. And the third requirement is what kind of stress is being applied and how much. So we'll talk about the different types of stress here shortly, but that is compressional, tensional, and shearing types of stresses. So what is geothermal gradient? Remember learning about that concept in metamorphic rocks in terms of temperature changes, specifically an average of 25 degrees Celsius for each individual kilometer that the rocks are buried subsurface or travel distance beneath the surface of the earth. So obviously there comes a point where you're going to have rocks that can be very mushy and molten. At some point they can become completely molten. Interestingly though, there have been earthquakes that have occurred literally for over 400, almost 500 kilometers beneath the Earth's surface, indicating that not all rocks are completely mush and liquid all the way down towards the lower mantle. Why do I bring that up? It's important to understand that geothermal gradient really applies what we're talking to until we get to most of the mantle, probably somewhere in the asthenosphere. So, the pressure element of geothermal gradient is just as important as temperature. That pressure increases at an average of 5,000 psi, which is pounds per square inch, on average per kilometer of depth. So the higher the pressure, the easier it is to bend rocks. The same is true with temperature, for the reason I listed on that candle. This plays a huge role in how deformation can occur to a rock. So obviously, if you got a lot of pressure with depth and a lot of temperature, you're going to make those rocks more malleable and bendable, which is why we can get phenomenal shapes in rocks called folds. So what is rock stress? That's the type of impact that's happening to rocks that causes them to fold or break. There are three distinctive types of rock stress. So we're going to look at the diagram first, and then I'm going to demo for you what some of these would look like. So we get some rock layers on the upper left here that are just naturally laid down. And as that occurs, and they're undergoing burial beneath new rock layers beneath the Earth's surface, you can see how if they are compressed... So if I have a rubber band and I smush it together, that's compression. That's compression. 
that's going to cause rocks to bend and to thrust upwards, right? To be pushed upwards. So the opposite movement to compression is tensional. As I stretch this rubber band, eventually I'm going to get too much and it's going to snap back into place. You'll learn about that called the elastic rebound theory when we get to earthquakes. But tension pulls rocks apart. There's still another type of stress, and that would be something similar to scissors that shear, as you see these scissors moving. Side to side motion, which is causing rocks to slide past one another. You could never have compression and tension happen together, but you could have compression and shearing occur together. You could also have tension and shearing together. But think about why you can't have compression and tension together. The law of physics would basically say that those are opposing types of motion, so that's going to not happen. But you certainly can have shearing happen with either one of either compression or tension. And that does happen in nature and can create some unusual problems, geologically speaking. So the type of stress that is applied to rocks also dictates what type of geologic structure can form, whether that's a fold, a fault, a basin, a dome, geologic jointing. You'll learn about all of these things here in a minute. So let's start with tension. Again, tension is this action. I'm pulling this rubber band, and you can see I'm stretching it. That's often how students feel as they are approaching test time or midterms or final exam time. You feel stretched, right? So tension in geology terms can produce some unusual things called rifting, R-I-F-T-I-N-G. Remember geologic rifts from plate tectonics? That can cause land to separate on continents. Pulling apart divergent plate boundaries, the same thing can happen in the ocean, causing mid-oceanic ridges. So when we get tension in rock layers, they tend to pull apart. That can create some unusual geologic features, for example, normal faults. Compression. Here's that rubber bend again, and I'm going to smush it together. That is compression. Compression pushes rocks together, and as that occurs, it's going to bring things up and lift them up. It causes uplift. So this creates things like all folds. You need to know that. Every single fold is caused by compression. It also causes reverse faults and thrust faults. Very important type of stress, but so is uh, tension. And that brings us to the third type which is the shearing mechanism, which was the scissors I showed you. So as things slide past each other like this, they can hold that stress, those rock layers, and eventually the rock layers, like you see in this picture right here, they are going to get stretched too far, and that is going to cut loose. Well, that can create something called an earthquake. We also see shearing and types of special faults known as strike slip faults, and you'll be learning about those when we get to faults here. So it's time to start learning about measuring our rock deformation. This is somewhat of an abstract concept, and students sometimes struggle with understanding what we call strike and dip of rock layers. But I thought this was a good place to start because let me put you in the shoes of a gold prospector. If you were going to go in search of gold, you would want to look in rock layers and in places that probably have it or else you don't want to waste a bunch of time, right? Knowing the angle that that rock layer could have that gold in it, let's say this is, and in fact this is a gold-bearing rock layer right here, you would want to know the angle at which that rock layer is buried in the surface, some of it may be above surface, and you would also want to know the compass direction in which that rock layer is orientated, so you are digging in the right places for gold. The reason we care about strike and dip and measuring these factors for any rock layer that's been deformed, meaning it's been tilted, uplifted, it's been folded, it helps us understand 
where that could be used and where we could find the things in the rocks that we want to use, such as gold. I'll give you another reason why we take strike in depth. Let's say we find dinosaur fossils. We would want to know exactly the tilt of the land layer that they're in and precisely the compass direction because we want to be able to lay out a storyboard, a grid that explains exactly how we found those fossils. It could tell us a lot about burial conditions, how the animal died, the environment in which they lived. So geologists use two things to measure rock deformation, strike and dip. So what do those terms mean? Let's start with the easiest one first, which is dip. So the dip is measured by these little marks right here, these hatcher marks, and they represent, they just come straight out like this, and then a numerical number, an Arabic number is put right here to tell you the degree of dip from its original position of flat. So if you saw this mark right here, and instead of 30, it said 10, that means the dip would be 10 degrees. If this mark came out, and it always does, just perpendicular to the strike line, if it said 70, you would know that the angle of inclination is 70 degrees. So that's one part. This line that goes up and down tells you the compass direction of the rock layer and how it's buried. That's referred to as the strike. Talking about strike, I feel like it's important to go back to this picture right here. There's no magic line on any rock layer, unless it's been spray painted on by like a geologist, that shows you where the strike is. It's an imaginary line. And so that's what this yellow line is supposed to represent up here. And this is your dip. So this angle right here would represent your dip. So let's go back and look at those two terms again with that kind of image in your mind. And when you see these lines like this, this is telling you how it's orientated, meaning the rock layer. So in this case, our legend says that the arrow pointing upward is north. So let's say that line was pointed more like this direction then it would be a northeast to southwest orientation. But we can tell with these layers that they're all pointed in the same northerly direction. That's the compass direction. That's the strike direction. And then we need to put a dip to it, which is that 30 degrees. Looking at the diagram below, that just shows you the inclination of 30 degrees and then the orientation of those rock layers. Because in the field, we need to know how these rocks are laid down. We don't want to just have an idea of where we might want to dig for gold. We want to have a pretty good solid foundation and hypothesis that this is where we're going to spend our money, our time, and our efforts to find something that can have a big payback. Geologists don't just use strike and dip for finding gold, of course. We use it to understand and map rock layers around the world. So why do we map rock layers? So we can tell the story geologically, all the clues based on what you've learned thus far, like the rock types, the rock thickness of each rock layer, their characteristics, their fossils. That pieces together a historical storyline that we can use to determine what was going on in geologic past. When you're measuring strike and dip, you use something called a Brunton compass. And this is a prior student of mine who's also a professional geologist now, and she is measuring strike and dip and teaching other people how to do it, I might add. So again, the strike is the compass direction. So that's this imaginary line right here where I put the red arrow. Again, it's not on any rock. It's just an imaginary line that's perpendicular to the dip, which is that angle of inclination. So when we're thinking about dip, remember it's always made by that little mark that comes down perpendicular to that parallel line of the strike. And then the number that we put with that tells you the degree of inclination. But this Brunton compass is how we do that. And strike and dip is not necessarily an easy measurement to take. It is actually fairly complex, especially for strike. But it's an important set of measurements that geologists use for describing rock layers out in the field. So that brings us into understanding specific geologic structures. And we will start with geologic folds. 
Yep, you heard that right, folding. <laughs> what are rock folds? Simply, as rocks get subjected to geothermal gradient, both temperature and pressure increases, they become more ductile and pliable, which allows them to bend more easily. Again, this happens beneath the surface, not at the surface. Rocks become more brittle. I know that's a concept that may seem awkward. You're thinking, well, rocks are hard. They're hard to break. Yes, they are. But beneath the surface, when they're buried, let's say kilometers beneath the surface, and you're getting that increase of 25 degrees Celsius per kilometer you travel, and 5,000 pounds per square inch for each kilometer the rock layer travels beneath the surface, in other words, buried, you can begin to see how that would allow for rock layers to become more malleable or bendable. And as you get towards the surface, that heat and pressure is much less, making those rocks much cooler, I might add. So they're more likely to rupture and break, which is not gonna create a fold, it would create something called a fault. Every single fold is made by the same type of stress. So today as we go through each of these different types of phenomena, if they're caused by a specific type of stress, I'm gonna emphasize that and you need to know that for testing purposes. So all folds, whether they're anticlines, synclines, or monoclines, are made by compressional stress. That brings us to learning about the three types of folds, and we'll start with monoclines. The prefix mono means one, so this refers to the bending or flexing of rocks in one direction, not uniformly in multiple directions, this way like an arch or a smiley face. It only bends in one direction, and you can see that at this location. This is at the Colorado National Monument. And can you see how the flexing of the rock layers are bending in one way, not all the way over like a big arch? So that would be indicative of what we call a monocline. Here's another monocline. Can you see how these rock layers are kind of folded upwards in one area? They're not flexing Similarly, on both sides, they're only flexing on one distinctive side. That makes it a monocline. Besides a monocline, there are still two more, and we'll begin with synclines. Synclines, use the S, make kind of a smiley face shape, a concave shape. So they have a downturn fashion of rock layers that make an upside down arch. And I'm going to show you what I saw as I got trained as a geologist in the field where a joke had been done to a syncline where people actually spray painted on eyes and a nose and a mouth like this onto their synclines. <laughs> and that is how I remember it. So it makes a concave shape, S for smiley face, very distinctive. So let's look at this syncline. This one's actually in Chile in South America. Can you see the flexing that makes that concave shape? So put the smiley face on and you'll know that that's the syncline. We'll get into my personal favorite of the folds, which are anticlines. I like all of them, but for some reason I just like anticlines because I like rainbows and arches. <laughs> that's what they remind me of. This causes rock layers to fold upwards like an arch, A for arch, and it makes a convex shape. So you can't put a smiley face on this one, it wouldn't work. So this is, remember, all of them are caused by compression, but this is causing them to push upward. So if your brain's starting to work on this, you're like, well, couldn't you see them together? The answer is absolutely yes. You see anticlines and synclines commonly make almost an S pattern in rock outcrops where rock folding is indicative. So think about where that might be. You're gonna see rock deformation in places where compression has happened, specifically at convergent plate boundaries. This anticline right here, this is one in Wyoming, and can you see that arch shape that makes there? That is an anticline. So let's see if you can remember which is which. Looking at this, this makes the arch. So is that a monocline, a syncline, or an anticline? If you guessed anticline, spot on. Looking at this one, what do you think? Well, can you put the smiley face on? You bet you can, and so that makes it the syncline. 
looking at this, well, what do you see? I see bent rocks that kind of look like a downward bent. So can we put a smiley face on it? Yep, that makes it a syncline. Well, let's look at the one I showed you when we started this lesson. Notice that the flexing of the rock looks like this. So it's smiling back at you. That's your syncline. You're like, there's a bunch of these in here. Well, they're common, and I want you to know what they are. So is this an anticline, monocline, or syncline? And if you guessed smiley, syncline, you are spot on again. Oh, you're like, well, this is different. Now, think about it. Is it a monocline, a syncline, or an anticline? So you do have kind of a beginning of an arch, but it only flexes in one single direction. So it could only be a monocline. Let's see, it's bending and kind of making this shape. So could you put a smiley on there? You betcha. So that makes it a syncline. All right, let's move into complex folds. Sometimes we get extreme folding that can actually cause what our folds to literally cram up together because of intense compression. Why does this happen? So typically, we get lateral pressure that's more severely applied to one side of a set of rock layers as opposed to another. Here's how that could happen in, in real life. Let's say you get an island arc that is approaching the North American craton, and I'll just use one de Fuca. So that is a divergent plate boundary between the Pacific plate and Juan de Fuca, and that diverging MOR is pushing Juan de Fuca as a convergent plate boundary into North America, making a subduction zone. So as Juan de Fuca is smashing into North America, North America, while it's slowly drifting, is not moving nearly as fast as Juan de Fuca. So the pressure would be more severely applied to the Juan de Fuca side of the rock layers as opposed to the North American side. And you can begin to see that in how rock layers could be affected. Going back to what I said earlier, rock layers are going to be more severely impacted as they're buried deeper inside the earth in that range before they become molten because more geothermal gradient is a, applied to them, more heat and more pressure. Sometimes we get a situation where the impact and the collision of a convergent plate boundary is so significant that it takes rock layers, not only folds them, but it turns them on their side. This can create something called a recumbent or overturned fold. You need to know that. There are many complex types of fold, but this is the one that I think is the most worthy to discuss in an intro level class. Because recumbent folds tell a story. They tell us that there has been significant rock deformation that occurred in the area. And when it gets turned on its side like that, that indicates that we had some really powerful convergent plate boundary that affected this region. So likely some type of serious mountain building event at a convergent plate boundary. Here's a really good look at a recumbent fold. And can you see how it's literally making this kind of pattern? Sometimes we get some added shearing on top of recumbent folds, which allows it to almost make a looks like it's been pancaked all the way down and it can almost look like folded sheets because the rocks are so severely compressed together. Now that you've learned about folds, let's look at some other geologic structures, starting with joints. And these are geologic joints if you get my draft. Geologic joints are fractures in rock in which no visible or discernible movement has occurred along that fracture line. If it had moved, we would call it a fault. So geologic joints could turn into faults. That's important to know. So let's take a look at this place called Checkerboard Mesa, a famous place on the western side of Zion National Park in Utah. And that's my favorite national park. And I hope you get to go there one day. But looking at this, do you see these fracture lines that I pointed to right here? How did those get there? 
It wasn't just by frost wedging, where frost wedging could maybe help make them bigger. You might also know there's some going horizontally as well. It happened because the Colorado Plateau got uplifted millions of years ago while these rocks were still buried underground, causing stress on them. And so it put fractures in the rock. And now today you can see that pattern, and that's the Navajo sandstone that you're looking at. Of course, it's affected today by forms of physical and even chemical weathering, and I might add some biological weathering. So frost wedging, you know, trees growing in the rocks can bust it apart. But the joints that you're seeing there, that checkerboard pattern was created by natural processes, in this case of compression. There's a special type of jointing called columnar jointing. Columnar jointing is caused when we have like our mafic types of basalt cool off and they make this unique pattern you see right here. So this is in Iceland. I took the shot on the coastline there. And these are some phenomenal columnar joints. And so this is not a very common type of thing to see with any other type of igneous rock. It's pretty much dedicated to seeing in mafic igneous rocks. But wherever you see it around the world, that's a clue. And it tells you that, one, there was igneous and volcanic activity, and two, the type of material that cools into these unique shapes called columnar joints. There are two more structures that I think are worthy for you to know about, which are basins and domes. So going back to strike and dip, we have to use this information on maps to determine if we have a depression in the ground, which would be a basin, or we have an uplifted structure that's similar and uniform in size, you'd use strike and dip markers to do that. So here's your strike line right here in all four locations, and you see how that dip line is pointing inward towards the basin. So that means if it's pointing inward, the dip is going downwards. It's going into a depression or into a bowl. So if you were at the top of this thing, you could slide into the bowl in a basin because that's the direction of the dip marks. It would be like sliding. If you're at the top of the slide and you were sliding in this direction, you would slide into the basin. And here's an exposed basin right here. I should point out that basins can be very important geologically. They can form lakes embayments. They can also house seawater during a transgression that you just learned about. And that water can sit there and evaporate over time, leaving evaporite deposits behind. But remember that we look at the strike and the dip marks to determine if we have a basin or a dome. This is Enchanted Rock in Texas. It's a state park near Fredericksburg. And the dome is its actually a batholith, to be more exact. You would have your strike marks, and notice that the dip marks are pointed the other direction, indicating that this is the top, and you would slide down the outside of it. So that means your these would be your strike lines up here. Your dips would be coming this way, so you'd be sliding down the hill, not into the bowl. That's how you can tell the difference between a basin and a dome. That brings us to looking at geologic faults. There are multiple types of faults, but here's how faults differ from joints. There is a fracture in a rock, that's a joint, in which there has been discernible movement. That escalates it from being just a joint to a fault. There are two major groups of faults. There are dip-slip faults. Now that you know what dip is, that's where things... Uh, the dip is inclination, right? So dip slip means that you got the head wall, which you'll learn about in a minute, that slips one way or the other, up or down, relative to the foot wall. And that's caused either by compression or tension. Then we have something called strike slip faults, and those are only caused by shearing. <laughs> so there are two major groups, and we're going to look at each one. So let's take a look at the left picture here. This is of just basic jointing of some rock layers there, of joints. And notice, though, that there's been no discernible movement. Kind of looks like checkerboard mesa, but with a different rock, right? But on the right, you can see I took a shot of a rock that was in Sedona, Arizona. And while it looks like it's a big footprint, this is simply where the 
porosity and permeability and it bleached out some of the oxidation of this rock layer. And it's just laterally moving side to side. It's shearing that caused that. So just refocusing on this and making sure you're clear, faults do have movement along their fault plane, which is that the fracture in the rock. So if it's a dip-slip type fault, that's going to mean this thing called the head wall is going up or down. In this case, it's slipping down. It can push up as well. That forms a different type of fault. But in a strike-slip fault, notice that they're just simply moving side by side. And you have diagrams like this in your book to show you how that works. So let's look at each of the faults, but we have to learn about why we call head wall and foot wall what we do and hanging wall. So in the old mining days, the reason that the wall that was called the hanging wall was named that was because miners had to squat down and that's where their head would end up resting and it was hanging on the ceiling of wherever they had put a mine shaft. So they called that the hanging wall. Today's world, we call it the head wall. So they're interchangeable terms, hanging wall, head wall. The foot wall was where they would put their feet when they were doing their mining. So that's how it got named the foot wall. Important for you to hear this. No analyzing these faults. Don't start going, well, what if I looked at it from this direction and this direction? Just you're coming face right at it and you're looking at it head on, right? Straight on to make this determination. So all you have to do is learn how to draw a head wall and a foot wall on every type of fault that you have. And you just draw it straight up perpendicular to the fault line right there. And then you're going to put feet at the bottom and a head at the top. And I'll show you exactly how to do this. But the way we classify faults is based on the movement of the head wall relative to the foot wall. Don't get hung up on the direction of how the foot wall is moving. It's strictly based on the movement of the head wall. This is uniform and done the same way across all over the world. <laughs> People and geologists name faults and interpret them based on this system I'm showing you now. That's why I have uh, pictures of stick humans on your faults in the book. <laughs> there are two parts to the dip slip fault, the head wall and the foot wall. I've just explained to you why they're called what they are. So uh, from this point forward, I won't call it the hanging wall, we'll call it the head wall. So the movement of the head wall relative to the foot wall determines on whether you have a normal fault if it's moving down because of tension, because something slips down as it's pulled apart by tension. Or in compression, you would get something that smushes upward and that's causing the head wall to create either a reverse fault or a thrust fault. To draw this stick person on your faults, just get some scratch paper out and try this. Just make some faults, just a line, even a simple line, and you're going to get practicing just drawing that straight line for the body. Put feet on and put a head on. And then wherever you drew the head, that part of the rock layer wall, that's going to be your head wall. Wherever the foot is drawn or the feet, that's going to be the foot wall. It's that easy. It's not something you need to analyze, get like, it can't be harder than that. It's really not. It's so simple. So on normal faults, the head wall moves down relative to the foot wall because of tension. So let me pull out my rubber band again. Okay, so I'm stretching this rubber band. That's tension. That's going to cause the head wall to drop as it's being pulled apart. So when that occurs, it's going to move down relative to the foot wall. So you're like, in nature, there's not going to be cute little arrows drawn on the rocks. You're right. Sometimes you might see it spray painted on as a joke, kind of like the smiley faces on synclines. So how do you figure that out? See this rock layer right here? It matches this one right here. So here's your fault line. You can see that right here. So I just took my stick person and drew it right there, put my little feet on, put my little head on. And then I looked to see did what happened to the head wall relative to the foot wall. In this case, the head wall, since it should be up here and was up here before the fault occurred, <laughs> it was one continuous unit, it dropped relative to the foot wall. 
Remember learning about cross-cutting relationships in principles of geology? Well, this is the law of cross-cutting relationships. Faults are an example of that. So whenever you have tension and you get a fault, it creates something called a normal fault. Here's a normal fault, and you're like, well, how am I going to figure that out? Again, you're going to look for matching rock layers. So I just put in the arrows and I drew my stick human on. And you can see this layer and this layer match up, this one and this one match up, this one and this one. So what happened was we had some tension, some pulling apart, and the head wall dropped relative to the foot wall, making it by definition a normal fault. So what are reverse faults? They're the opposite. <laughs> reverse faults have the head wall that gets pushed up relative to the foot wall due to compression, but specifically at an angle equal to or, or greater than 45 degrees. And let me tell you why that's significant, because there's a special type of compressional fault called a thrust fault we'll learn about next. And those are all the ones that are less than 45 degrees. The only way you can form a reverse or a thrust fault is via the stress of compression, the same thing that forms all of our folds. So let's look at this rock layer. See this grayish area here and this grayish area here? They once matched up. So which way did the head wall move? You draw your stick human on, put your feet in your head. You can see that this gray layer, while it used to be here, has been shoved upwards. Now, I realize this is an introductory course, so how are you going to tell if it's a thrust fault when we get to those next? If it's not obvious, I'll put a degree of what the fault angle should be right in here. So I would put something like 45 degrees, that would make it a reverse fault. If I put something less than 45 degrees, it would be a thrust fault. But this is clearly one that should be a reverse fault equal to or greater than 45 degrees. All right, this is a reverse fault, but do you see how this layer right here should match up with this one? So you draw your stick human and the head walls up here, the feet are down here, the head wall got shoved up and above, which would be indication of compression. That is a reverse fault. If it was less than 45 degrees, then by definition, it would have to be a thrust fault. Bringing us to thrust faults. Thrust faults are kind of interesting. They're by far the most fun of all of the faults because of several reasons. Remember, they have an angle less than 45 degrees where you had compression take rock layers and shove them on top of other ones. Here's where it gets interesting. When it does that, you can actually get older rock layers that get shoved on top of Younger rock layers, well, that kind of puts a mess for the law of superposition, doesn't it? But remember, superposition simply said that the oldest rock layers at the bottom was laid down first, and the one on top of it was laid down after that. So this kind of reshuffles rock layers after the fact. But notice that this angle's really low. I mean, this is substantially lower than 45 degrees, and it's a pretty good example to match this one right here. So the reason you're not seeing another rock layer that looks like this, this is such a significantly low angle of thrusting that it just pushed rocks that were underneath right on top of this one. Thrust faults are by far the most interesting of all faults when you're looking at the stories that they can tell us. Probably one of the most famous thrust faults in North America is found in an uh, Glacier National Park and this is a big outcrop in Glacier that you can see and this is an interesting thing because Cretaceous sandstones would be rocks that you might be able to find something like let's say T-Rex fossils in. I'm not saying that's for sure there but certainly Mesozoic aged vertebrate type of fossils. But instead what we have above it are Precambrian aged limestones. When I mean Precambrian, they're about a billion years old, where these Cretaceous sandstones are probably somewhere between 80 and 66 million years old. So how did one billion year old or a thousand million year old rock get above this stuff that's less than a hundred million years old? It happened because of thrust faulting. And this particular fault is known as the Lewis Thrust Fault, which is named after Lewis and Clark expedition that mapped out this area. 
That brings us to the third group of faults, which are strike slip faults. The other groups, meaning dip slip, included normal faults, reverse faults, and thrust faults. Normal faults caused by tension as a dip slip fault, and the other two dip slip faults were reverse and thrust caused by compressional stress. Which brings us to the third type of fault, which are strike slip faults. Going back to the word strike, that is that compass line, right, that we learned about for measuring uh, strike and dip. Strike slip faults have the movement of fault blocks laterally, sideways, and it's not moving up and down via compression or tension, which is why we don't need a head wall or a foot wall. So we describe strike slip faults instead of being dip slip where you have a head wall and a foot wall, we describe them as left lateral and right lateral strike slip faults. And that's based on the uh, obvious movement of the fault block relative to the direction of the person that's mapping it out, looking at it. So when you see this, this is a strike slip fault and there's not been up and down, there's just been sideways shearing stress applied. This is a place in China and can you see that this layer right here should match up with some of this up here, like right here. So what's happened is these things are moving sideways relative to each other via shearing. We have a place very similar to this in North America called the San Andreas Fault. And it's probably the most famous strike slip fault in the world, doing exactly the same thing. Here's that strike slip fault in Sedona that I was showing you. It's not moving up and down, so there's no tension, no compression. Instead, there's shearing that's causing this area to move sideways. Can you see the fault line right through here, this fracture in the rock here? If there was fracture and no movement, we would call that a joint. But since there's movement, it's a fault. And it's important to look at all of the clues to determine what you're seeing and going on in a geologic area. You're looking at a highly deformed set of rock layers in Waterton International Peace Park indicating significant faulting and folding. Some at places of which are very famous for faults because uh, in some cases there's been thrust faulting that's shoved uh, older sedimentary rock layers onto younger sedimentary rock layers. And that's what thrust faults do. In addition to having faults and folds, this area has been carved out by glaciers. And I'll show you a profile here. Uh, the Waterton area, there's only several ways to get here. You can uh, bike down the sides of these forests that you see here or boat. I mean, you really can't drive in the sense of a car. You've got to have all-terrain vehicles. You still have to have a passport if you hike in from the United States, and there is a place at the a border, and I'm going to point that out to you right here, where approximately the United States border is located. In addition to being uh, famous for this beautiful landscape, this area is also famous for the Prince of Wales Hotel. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. It's a beautiful place. And there's a good reason why people come to see it, lo this location. Besides the incredible wilderness and beauty that's been left behind by the last ice age, you must focus in on the key components related to our lessons right now, which is faulting. So I'm going to zoom in on a fault that's in the walls of this Precambrian rock. And I want you to try to determine what type of stress would have created this fault to form? Was it compression, tension, or shearing? See if you can find the head wall and the foot wall to determine what type of fault it is. Let's get into combination faults. So it's kind of like going through the drive through and you get the option for a combo meal. Well, we can have combo meals for faults. <laughs> Sometimes we can get the strike slip plus either tension or strike slip plus compression. It can't be compression plus tension. It can only be shearing plus tension or shearing plus compression. But nevertheless, if you get that, you get something called an oblique slip fault. It's important that you keep that word slip in there because slip is indicating that it's having that sideways movement. The oblique is determined by whether you have a normal oblique slip fault or you have a reversed or thrust oblique slip fault. 
So we have dip slip and lateral movement occurring together. These are some of the most devastating of all faults for consequences to human structures, and I might add severity of earthquakes, especially when we get something that would be like a mega thrust oblique slip fault. And that happens in some of our largest earthquake events around the globe. So in order to qualify as an oblique slip, you must have strike and dip movement that is measurable along the fault zone in both directions, meaning strike and the angle of dip. So literally, you can get a gap in the ground where this occurs. So that would be devastating if this fault happened overnight and you were driving this way on the higher block here and then didn't know that it had separated, you would fall right into the middle of it. That's why oblique slips are so dangerous. And imagine if a house was there or a neighborhood or where people existed, buildings. This would be very serious. There's a, two types of complex faults that involve combinations of normal faults in both cases, Horst and Grobbins. So let's look at Horst first. The way I remember Horst is kind of from my days in track and field. Where the field part was, I threw javelin and we would have to pull that javelin and hoist it into the air. Or maybe you had a heavy box and you had to push it way up to get it onto a shelf in your closet. Now this is not caused by compression. Let me tell you that first up. It's caused by tension. So what's going on here? And Fault blocked areas, you get some big giant section of block of earthen material that is separated by faults on either side. In the case of Horst and Grobbins, which we'll get to right after this, there are normal faults on either side of the fault block. So how's a Horst unique? So this would be the original land level, okay, in other words, where all of this was to begin with. This would have been up here, this would have been up here. To make a horse, you have to have two sets of normal faults, one on the left side, one on the right side of the fault block, causing the two sides to drop down, leaving the horse where it used to be before that event occurred. Again, this can only be formed by tension because it's normal faults on both sides. So it appears that the horse has actually been pushed upwards when in reality is it's right where it was to begin with. When we look at a grobin, this is sometimes called a trough fault, but it's a grobin, and a grobin is where the major fault block drops because these normal faults, this is the original land level, so this would have been up here and up here, and then the grobin falls. And as it falls, you have a normal fault on either side, and it falls via or because of tension. This can create things like rift zones and mid-oceanic ridges. So let's see if your memory is pretty good. What kind of structures are these? This was a checkerboard mesa. Those are the cracks in the rock where no movement has occurred. And you're thinking, yep, I remember that one. Joints! <laughs> yep, that's what a joint looks like right there. By the way, if you go here, this thing is huge. This does no justice because I'm on the ground looking up, but I mean, it is monster huge when you're looking straight up at this. All right, so you got to see there's no visible push out and move sideways. So this is strictly an up or down dip slip type movement. So you would draw your stick human. So your stick human, here's your foot, here's your head wall. These two pieces are the darker colored blacks here. They have been shoved up and definitely at or above 45 degrees. So would that be a normal fault, reverse fault, or a thrust fault? If it's a equal to or above 45 degrees, it must be a reverse fault. All right, let's see if you can figure this one out. You have to draw your stick human. I put the arrows on for ease. So I'm putting my foot wall here. Here's my head wall. These two white layers should match up. They don't. Instead, the head wall slipped down relative to the foot wall. And if you said that was a normal fault, you're correct. But here's my question for you. <laughs> what kind of stress caused it? That's just as important. So like we saw the reverse fault, compression caused that, just like it would a thrust fault. Normal faults are always caused by tension. 
right, you learned about this one. So these used to be at the same level. We have normal faults on either side, causing these to drop relative to the normal ground or original ground level, making this appear to be uplifted. This is a horst or grobin. Which one would that be? And in, it is a horst, if that's what you called it. All right, here's a fold. So I can't put a smiley here. That's not going to work. And it's not a full arch. It's only flexing in one direction. So do I have a monocline, a syncline, or an anticline? If you guessed monocline, you are correct. So here's another fault, and let's take a look at it. We only have, we don't have sideways movement per se. We just have up or down movement, so it's a dip slip. And you're going to draw your stick human, and your head wall's here. It looks like your head wall's moved down relative to your foot wall. What kind of fault would that be? And a normal would be correct. When you look at this, you might go, wow, there's a lot of mismatch stuff going on here. You're absolutely right. And I might point out that there's this is a big giant fault right here, block. So we have fault movement here. We also have it here. So really, this is either a horse or a grobin, but we're going to just use it as one of the dip slip faults for now. So let's match up this layer to this layer. So draw your stick human on. Your head wall's here relative to your foot wall. The white layer has dropped relative to your foot wall. So would that be a normal reverse or thrust dip slip fault? If you said normal, you are correct. And that is caused by compression, tension, or shearing. You've got to know which stress causes each of these faults. It's absolutely critical. All right, let's take a look at this. And now you see a fold that's making an arch. So A for arch, would that be a syncline, an anticline, or a monocline? And if you guessed it was an anticline, you are correct. What type of fault is this? It's sideways movement a right lateral or a left lateral, and it's only slipping in one direction. So it can't be a dip slip. It is a strike slip. So what type of stress caused that? Was it tension, compression, or shearing? You've got to know what stress causes which type of fault to form. In this case, shearing. This is another one of those combination faults. So this area would have been equal to here and here, but we have two normal faults on either side, causing the middle block of unit of rock to literally fall because of tension. Is that a horst or is that a grobin? And that is definitely a grobin. The way I remember grobins is you'd have to reach down to grab it to pull it back up, and that's an easy way to remember them. Now we have something interesting. See how I gave you a degree? Here, so we got a dip slip because we got movement either up or down. So draw your stick human. Here's your foot wall. Here's your head wall. This white piece of rock material should be together, but they're no longer. So what's happened is this whole section has shoved on top of this other block. And I just put a random number of 31 degrees. It's certainly less than 45. That's the point, <laughs> is that I'm going to give you that number. So would that be a normal? fault, a reverse fault, or a thrust fault. And think about the difference between them. Compression caused it, so it either has to be a reverse fault or a thrust fault. And remember the definition, which one is less than 45 degrees, and that would be a thrust fault. What type of stress caused this to form? So while I didn't put any kind of indicator here, you can just see it. It's flexing, looking like it is a smiley face. So if you can draw that smiley face on there, you're going to know it's a syncline rather than a monocline or an anticline. Looking at this, look at your strike and dip, and can you determine if this is a basin or if this is a dome based on the direction of the dip marks here, 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 here. They're all pointing in indicating that it's going downhill into a bowl, which would make this a basin, not a dome. Do you remember what this was called? 
This is a place in Iceland. It's a, and when I took this shot, it was a great hike, but it was totally worth the effort to get there. It's one of the most scenic places I've been in the world. This is that special type of igneous material that cools off and makes a very unique pattern, similar to checkerboard mesa, but with igneous rocks. And that is columnar jointing. Let's apply what you've learned and what you know. One thing about folds is that they can capture oil and gas. I put anticlines, but synclines could too as well. But anticlines are known to kind of trap oil and natural gas in, in their spot, making them optimal locations for drilling for petroleum uh, fossil fuels. And that is a real life example of how geology can play an important role for economics and human use. This is an example of a basin that filled up with water, marine water to be exact, from a transgression. And now it's made this giant evaporite basin filled with salt, halite. We look for these types of resources for economic use and gain. So salt deposits are extremely valuable to humans for a variety of different purposes, not just for food, but you can think of even during winter months for snow and ice uh, work on roads. There's lots of things that salt is used for. This is just one example of the value of something like a geologic structure known as a basin could provide. You learned about Horst and Robbins, and that creates a very unique landscape in North America called the Basin and Range that extends through the Nevada area all the way down through West Texas. So you get a series of normal faults that create a variety of different Horst and Robin features out throughout the Basin and Range province. And what happens is that tension has created the means to form Grobbins and Horst, Grobbins and Horst, Grobbins and Horst. So you get a topography that gets flat, tall, flat, tall, flat, tall, and that's created by the phenomena of Horst and Grobbins. This is an example of another way that we are impacted by different types of stresses geologically. Tensional faults, normal faults, create rift zones on continents. And this would be the Rio Grande Rift in New Mexico, which created a series of volcanic eruptions significantly throughout that region. And this is an active rift zone. It's not moving very fast by any means, but it's still a place that is separating the continent very, very slowly. Compressional faults can be very important for earthquakes. And unfortunately, the worst earthquakes been measured by humans in terms of magnitude, and I might also damage, are what we call megathrust earthquakes. So this is reverse and thrust faults that are caused by compression. But megathrust is typically where you have a continental plate that's being folded as the ocean plate's going down, and then it does this action, releases, and kind of flops up and down. And if there's water there where the ocean is, like you see this diagram right here, this whole thing can pop up and create a series of tsunami waves. So we care about these structures that you learned about, faults and folds, basins, domes, jointing. They, they are important to livelihoods of humans in many different ways. You may have questions or concerns, and that's understandable. This picture is taken in Arizona, right near the turnoff of where the Vermilion Cliffs are, if you're going towards the north rim of the Grand Canyon. And you can see some rock deformation that's occurred there and evidence of mass wasting, I might add, which you'll be learning about in the next section, and as well as orogenic events, which are mountain building events. Let's have a nature moment and we'll come back and talk a little bit more. This is a close-up look at Checkerboard Mesa and the big giant jointing has a whole different perspective, doesn't it? You see these wild animals there and they're quite adept to going up and down these steep dipped hills, meaning the inclination. By the way, I took this shot, it was a super windy day and that's why it's a little unsteady. 
And I have a super telephoto lens, but there were people way too close to the wildlife, which is not okay to do. And they got in trouble for it, but there was bumper to bumper traffic, people wanting to see wildlife. But a good shot of looking at the joints and how animals were using them even for a rest period. So welcome back. Your next section you'll be learning about erogenic events, mass movements, and mass wasting. I can't wait to share that with you because it's a lot of information that's fun to learn about and it correlates directly to what you learned about today. For testing purposes, make sure that you know the difference between the three types of folds, the various types of faults. Can you tell which type of stress creates those faults and folds? Do you know the difference between a joint and a fault? How to use the strike and dip marks to determine if a basin or a dome is present on a map. These are the key elements that you should have taken away from this lesson. I will see you in the next section. Bye.